like to say good morning to each one of you this morning. It's good to have each one out in the worship service this morning. We've had several come in. Certainly we're thankful you all come to join us here at Park Avenue for worship service. We had 39 in Sunday school this morning, and our offering was $1,112 taken up through the Sunday school. And last Sunday's worship service, we had 49, so still encourage ones. I know there's a lot of sickness going around, so if you see people who haven't been at church, encourage them to come to church. And this time, Brother Bobby's going to come lead us in some worship songs. to say a good morning to you. Welcome to Park Avenue. Join right in the song service. We're going to have them on the wall, brother. All right. You can sing off the wall if you want to. Just wondering if you want to use the book. Number 13, I Must Tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. He must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make up my trouble quickly and end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Tempted and tried, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, he all my cares and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil alludes me. Oh, how my heart is to sin. I must tell Jesus and he will help me over the world of victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. we go to number 31 he hideth my soul <clears throat> 31 <clears throat> He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He takes my 
my burden of He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that settled a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings he mama he crowned and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, oh glory to God for such a redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows so dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there When clothed in his brightness, as poor did I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Then let's go to 55. One way all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory While we walk the pilgrim pathway Clouds will overspread the sky But when traveling days are over Not a shadow, not a sign When we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory. Will the toil of heart repay when we all get to heaven? What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. 
and chains world had a hold on me my heart was a stone was covered in shame when he came for me I couldn't run couldn't run from his presence I couldn't run couldn't run from his arms Jesus, he loves me, he loves me, he is for me. Jesus, how can it be? He loves me, he is for me. And it was a fire deep in my soul. Be the same. I stepped out of the dark and into the light. When he called my name, I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms. Jesus, he loved.
as the mighty billows roll. Then they called upon the one who the winds and waves control. When he reaches out his hand, billows cease at his command. Wind and waves obey. still what man is this they all did say that the wind and sea obey he's the one who sails with me he's the master of the sea storms of life may rage, mighty billows round you roll. The world will see, as he did in days of old, as upon I see you sail, why don't you trust in me? Never fail. I'm so glad he sails with me. Oh, he's the master of the sea. When he reaches out his hand, fill a season his command. Wind and waves obey his wind. says to them be still what man is this they all did say that the wind and sea obey he's the one who sails with me oh he's the master of the sea he's the one who sails with me Amen. It's been been good so far, hasn't it? Been in God's house. That's some good music, some good uh, good songs that we got to hear, and I hope you've gotten to participate in uh, the worship service so far. But we get to continue in our participation by giving of our tithes and offerings. I'm going to ask at this time if you would stand. We're going to go ahead and ask our ushers to come forward. Ask if uh, Brother Bruce, would you lead our hearts in a word of prayer, please? Amen. You may be seated.
Amen. Go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. And part of uh, being, uh, being your pastor, I, I get to stand before you and open up God's Word. And, and there's, um, Paul said it this way to the church at Thessalonica. He said, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not, not the gospel of God only, but also our own so- souls because you were dear unto us. And so what I want to share with you this morning is something very personal. So I'm not just imparting to you uh, scripture necessarily, but I will be imparting a very personal uh, story with you. Uh, Whenever I was a young teenager, uh, I loved coming to church. Uh, I was about 15, 16 years old, and my parents, we we, we went from a Southern Baptist church, a manual Baptist church there in Carlisle, to Macedonia there in Humminoke. And I had never seen preaching like I saw uh, preaching at Macedonia. Uh, The preacher was very animated. He would go up and down the stage. He would go running every which way. I thought, this guy is crazy. He has lost his mind. Uh, But he was so excited about the truths that he was uh, conveying to the audience. And and I would just get so wrapped into what he was saying. Because to me, uh, I went to St. John's Lutheran School. And and, and to kind of give you an idea, um, we memorized the book of James in the fourth grade. The entire book of James in the fourth grade. So scripture to me seemed like what what to many people it seems like math. It's like math. Nobody likes math. It it was something I had memorized, something I had uh, done a great deal of painstaking effort to to be able to recite from memory. I never knew it could be something that was actually exciting. And so whenever Tommy Walls was up there, He was preaching his heart out about the truths of God, how that we are saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And it made me know that he believed it. And it was something that was worth listening to. And it was exciting. Well, um, also during that time, uh, there was another preacher that I herald as a a hero of the faith, uh, Jim Moss. He still is. He goes around and preaches revivals from time to time. And I remember it was like getting up uh, for uh, something that you were excited for, like Christmas. If I knew he was preaching the next day, sometimes I was, couldn't sleep sometimes because I was excited because he was going to convey a great and wonderful spiritual truth that was going to be exciting. Something, uh, something amazing was going to happen. People were going to get saved. Things were going to happen. And so I was very uh, uh, excited in my youth during those times. Then I went off to college. And, boy, it just kept getting better. Chad Graves, still to this day, the best preacher I've ever heard. Now, I've heard, you know, Adrian Rogers, and I've heard um, many different preachers that we can name. Uh, you, you think of Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley. I've heard, and I still listen to a lot of great preachers, but there's none that can compare to him. I hold him in that such rest- esteem. Because whenever I talk about uh, conveying to you the Word of God, he didn't just convey the Word of God. He conveyed it on such an emotional and powerful level that you felt like he was looking into your private life and exposing every sin that you've ever committed right there before you and still loved you for it. You know, and still loved you in spite of it. And so I, when I say that um, this is something very deeply personal, because, yes, those were some of the brightest days I've ever can recall, uh, of the Word of God coming alive to me, and all of a sudden, that all went away. And that happened because I was getting the Word of God, from an indirect source. Does that make sense? I wasn't seeking the Word of God for myself. I wasn't reading it for myself. Yes, I started reading the Word of God whenever I was in college uh, under Chad Gray's ministry. I would read it, and man, his preaching got better. It wasn't that he himself was better. It's that I understood more. I got more. I understood when he used an Old Testament reference over here. I knew what he was talking about. And so his preaching even got better. Some of you think my preaching may be lacking in that. Can I encourage you, if you'll read the Word of God, he might, he might point something out that I didn't even make mention about that he'll point to you in your life. Why? Because the Word of God is what? It's alive. It's living. It, 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 it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, and God brings that out uh, so many times. And, and whenever... 
I got to my senior year in college, it was the darkest days of my life. Uh, what I mean by that is, within the span of two months, Tommy Walls went off to Conway. Chad Graves went off to Monticello. And I was left with not a teacher. I was left without someone that would impart the Word of God, someone that was excited about the Word of God and would teach it faithfully to me and love me uh, enough to tell me the hard truths. Now, I'm not saying that the other preachers I listen to, uh, it's just that when you've had that experience, you, you, uh, you try to, you, and then you say, well, I'll just try and read the Word of God for myself. I couldn't pull the gems of scriptures out that they did if I studied it all my life. And I became discouraged in my walk with God because I didn't want to read it because I wanted to hear them. And so, you know, just like a, just like a crack addict, I would go to that place where they were preaching. I'd go up to Conway and, at Metal Lake Baptist Church. I'd listen to Tommy Walls. I'd go down to Monticello, and I would listen to Chad Graves preach. And I'd feel good about it for the moment. But there is a grave danger that I want you as a church to avoid is getting the Word of God secondhand. There's a great danger that's involved here. And I want you to look with me. It happened to the Israelites uh, coming out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 20, if you know your Bible well enough, you know that that is the chapter that the Ten Commandments are put out there. God spoke from heaven. I want you to understand this. God spoke the Ten Commandments to the Israelites. It wasn't Moses brought that out there and said, now, now, guys, this is the Ten Commandments. God verbally spoke to them the Ten Commandments. And this is what they had to say uh, to Moses. Exodus chapter 20, look at verse 18. Look at verse 18. And he said, and all the people saw the thunderings and lightnings and the noise of the trumpet. And the mountain was smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak not, uh, speak, the, you, you, we want you to speak with us. And we, will, and we will hear, but let not God speak unto us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your face, that you sin not. And let's pray together. Father, we come before you, Lord, just wanting to hear from you. Lord, we don't want to hear from a preacher up here and, it, and who, who may be animated at times and use voice inflection and all that great illustrations and stories, but Lord, we would want to hear from you this morning. Because it doesn't matter what I would say. It doesn't matter what anyone else would say. If we don't hear from you, nothing else matters. Because it's your word that makes a lie. It's your word that convicts and convinces us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Holy Spirit, you using the, this medium of your word, accomplish in our hearts what you set it to accomplish. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so what I want you to see the first danger that we see whenever we, we get the word of God secondhand by an indirect source. The first thing is, and for your notes, we... we we see that obedience is actually optional. It's optional obedience. Why is that? Well, because if God spoke to you this morning and he was to correct something in your life and he says, and he were to, and he were to convict you of that right this morning, and he spoke to you, and let's say for a moment it was verbally, you heard the voice of God. Well, then you only have two options. You're either going to obey it or you're going to tell God, I will not obey your word. Now, when you get the word through an indirect source, say a preacher, or a Sunday school teacher, or a deacon, if you get it from an indirect source, well, that's just the word of Brother Heath, Brother Charles. And so it becomes, you see what I'm saying? I don't carry the authority of God Almighty like, you see what I'm saying? Therefore, you would say, well, God didn't, this, well, I'm not going to dispute that that might be, God's, might be God's word, but that's still just a man. And so the word of God becomes optional. And you say, uh, and this is what happens when we get it from an indirect source. I want you to go ahead and turn about 12 more chapters forward, and I'll, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. 
So in the context of this, they've, they've asked Moses, we don't want to hear from God anymore. We want to hear it from you. You just tell us what God says and we'll do it. Sounds like a good idea. Exodus chapter 32, verse 1 is where I want you to look. See, when we hear from one of God's servants, obedience can seem optional. And God calls Moses up the mountain for an undisclosed amount of time. I want you to understand that. He didn't say how long he was going to be up there. And that's why when you look at Exodus 32, verse 1, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as of, or as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we woke not what has become of him. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, uh, obedience becomes optional. Uh, whenever the man of God, let's say, is no longer in the picture, too. Now, y'all wouldn't, you know, whenever I would go to drill, would see it being an option, now, would you, to come to church because the pastor wasn't here, now, would you? Based on attendance records, I would say you did. But what I want to get you to see is, is that when we see that it comes from a man, that the Word of God is being brought to you uh, through the medium of his servant, it can seem to be an optional thing. It's something that's optional. So I want you to see that that's the first thing that we see, is that they heard the voice of God. They heard it themselves saying, you shall not make a graven image. They heard it themselves. But look what happened. It seemed, it seemed only optional because after the Ten Commandments, Moses then got the word of God through uh, got the word of God directly, and then he would take it to the Israelites. Well, now that, now that he's gone, right, obedience becomes optional. And so I want you to see the next thing is that the, dec the next danger that we face whenever we get the word of God through an indirect source, say a Sunday school teacher, say uh, a pastor, or even a, a, a TV preacher or whatever, the, if this is the only source from which you get the word of God, this is the danger you follow, is the next one is that you follow a man instead of God. You run the risk of following a man instead of God. Now, there was a dysfunction, if you recall, in the church at Corinth, remember? There was a, there was a dis I mean, the very first chapter, he talks about the divisions that was going on in the church. Some were saying, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I was baptized by Peter. You see how, and he says, you were following a man. And what ends up inevitably happening, okay, whenever you become a follower of a man instead of God, and the next point for your A is that there's divisions that occur. It's inevitable. It happens, okay? Some of you, despite me being here for, uh, for about three and a half years, do not regard me as your pastor. That's okay. I get that. I do. Uh, because I understand that there were probably much more greater men of God than me that have, that have, uh, that has filled this, uh, this pulpit. They probably could do exegesis circles around me and uh, make, uh, make me uh, look, uh, look foolish as a preacher. I get that. I know preachers that are much better than me too. And I would much rather them be up here than me. But the point of the matter is uh, we have this problem when we follow a man instead of following God. Uh, some of you may have already latched on to me as your pastor. And uh, the problem is now that if there was another person that were to come and fill this pulpit other than myself, you would do the same disservice to them and comparing them from one man of God to another. And can I encourage you, don't do that. Don't do that to anybody. Uh, that, but that ends up happening when we follow a man instead of following God. Divisions naturally occur. And you start thinking and regaling. Remember back when we had Brother, and I, I, I think the world of him, so I'm going to use his name. Remember when we had Brother Ralph Ruffin? Boy, he was a good preacher. He was. He is still. Um, remember when we had Isaac Woodard? Remember when we had so You see how that, that can become a problem? is that whenever you start following a man, you stop hearing from God. And so the divisions occur is the first thing I want you to see. Divisions naturally will occur. 
And then there's the next thing I want you to see, is that when we're following a man instead of God, look what happens next. Uh, it, first of all, invites division, but next it, uh, we're going to see is that... Uh, is that in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. We, we, many times, many preachers, we've used this uh, to encourage a younger preacher or to, uh, we see this with um, uh, services of ordination uh, to commission them into preaching the Word of God. Paul tells young Timothy, he says, Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then he goes on to say, For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, it's easy to say, and we can look at the church of today and see that that may very well be, uh, that is very much a, a prevalent thing, but can I tell you what is not illustrated here or what is not normally hit on here is the preachers that are changing uh, the word to something of fables and stories. Why is that? I'm going to give you a deep, dark secret about your pastor and many other preachers. We have very fragile egos. We want to be liked. We do. We want to be liked. And, and sometimes people, in the spirit of wanting to be liked, will sometimes hedge the word of God, make it not so... Uh, so confrontational. You see what I'm saying? Because all in the spirit of be liked, and I'll tell you things that you want to hear so that you might say, you're a good preacher, Brother Heath. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm human just like all of you guys out here. That's my sin sometimes. Is I have to, many times I pray about the messages just so that I can have the backbone to say it. All right, so what I want you to see is that, that preachers have fragile egos and that there would come a time where there would be the demand of hearing things that are nice. How that God wants to prosper me. Don't talk to me about judgment and wrath to come. Don't talk to me about hell. That doesn't make sense. Why won't you tell me about how God wants to bless me? And then with the demand comes the supply. I'll tell you how God wants to bless you. How much God loves you. I can do that. You see how that works? And then you give me the pat on the back that I need and I give you what you want to hear. And that's why you don't follow a man. That's why you don't follow me. That's why you open the Word of God for yourself and let the Spirit of God so move on you. It's not enough if I've been moved. It's not enough that I have uh, sought the Word of God and I have sought and prayed for you guys. It's not enough. You need to seek out the Word of God for yourself. And don't take anyone's word for it. Take his word for it. Because we're fallible. I'm a sinful man. I'm fallible. And this is the next point. Uh, let me get you to the second point. This is, I want to tell you about the one thing that keeps me up at night. So preachers want to be liked. But then the next thing is verbal offenses. Okay? Verbal offenses. This has already happened in my ministry, and I grieve over it all the time. I don't concern myself so much uh, with if the Word of God were to offend you. Uh, that's something that you deal with, okay? If I show you chapter and verse and you have to kneel down before it and say, Lord, help me accept this, that's fine. I actually invite that sometimes in my own life. And I would expect it in yours. The thing that I stay up at night because of the office that I hold is that I could say something to you that's not scriptural, that's offensive. I would say something that would offend you, that has no, no bearing whatsoever about spiritual things or scripture or anything. You see what I'm saying? And then you would walk away, and not just walk away from the church or me, but you would walk away from the faith entirely. That's what keeps me up at night. That's why I, don't, that's why I try to keep from joking around too much. I used to have that about me. I, um, I, that's a loftus gene. If you know my uncle, you know that. And you know that if you know my dad, uh, we have a smart or a quick wit and a sharp mind, ready a sharp tongue to say it too. Uh, but I had to do away with those things and parts of my personality because why? I don't want to offend unnecessarily. 
But let me tell you something. It's going to happen. I, not when, not, not, not if, but when it happens, it's going to happen. Because I'm a sinful man just like you. I will inevitably say something, post something on Facebook, do something that you do not agree with or like, and if you walk away from the faith, it will grieve my very soul. But if I teach you to follow God and follow His Word, then that takes a load off of me worrying about the sins that I currently deal with. Okay? So the verbal offense. In James chapter 3, verse 2, it deals with that. It deals with that because this will, this will help you understand me a little bit better. For in many things we offend all. And if any man offends not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. You're not looking at a perfect man up here. You're looking at someone who's just as sinful and as wicked as any lost sinner was. But I am a sinner that's been saved by grace and I rest in his amazing grace. But I am still, get this, not, I have not arrived. None of us here have. If you have arrived, you've come to the wrong place. I have not spiritually arrived. I still deal with pride. I still deal with my own self-image and arrogance. I still do self-promoting. I still want you to like me sometimes. You see that that flesh is still ever with me. Sin is ever present with me. But to will, I will not. But to do what he was commanded me to do, that's what I need to find. And it's, but see, here's the thing. I'm going to mess up. I've, I'm, I'm going to just go ahead and put it out there. Never put a man up there on the pedestal. Of if he, as long as he's up there serving God, I'll be serving God. Never do that because he will inevitably fail. I can't tell you how many times uh, that men of God, people I have re, uh, respected deeply, have now not just walked away from preaching, walked away from the faith. And I don't pretend that that's not, I'm not able to do that. Okay? And that's why, I, if I can impart one thing to you, you follow the Lord your God. And make this your, your anthem. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't know what's going over there at the church house with the preacher and what's going on over there, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's what I want you to do, is because if you're following a man... Listen to this. A man can move on. Something could happen to me before the next week. I could die. Are you going to still follow him? You could move away. Another job, perhaps, or something else could happen. Um, there could be uh, a moral failure on my part about the preaching, and that, that of uh, I might accidentally, or not accidentally, sometimes, maybe, some preachers do it intentionally, of uh, preaching heresy. You're going to follow the scriptures and not me. I'm going to offend. But I pray that you would always follow him. The last thing I want you to see is what happens when we follow, uh, or when we, we get the word of God secondhand, is that there becomes a distortion of God's word. There's a distortion. Remember when the woman was there in the garden, and uh, Satan comes to the woman, and he, and he tempts her? He said, and he asked the question, look at ver, uh, Genesis 3, verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat, uh, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, God never said they couldn't touch it. You've got to go back to Genesis chapter 2 to know what was being said to the man and to the woman there, but actually the woman's not there. God tells Adam, you shall not eat of this fruit. So what does that tell you? Either Adam or Eve changed it. Adam imparts that to her. There's no record of uh, it saying that God uh, spoke to her directly, but we know that Adam is given the commandment, you shall not eat thereof. For the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. But whenever the serpent comes to eat, has God said that you shall eat of 
any and all the fruits of the garden? And she says, yes, we can eat anything we want, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we shall not eat, neither shall we touch it, lest we die. When we get the word of God secondhand, there's the temptation to add to it. That's what ends up becoming religion. Did you know that? Is adding to God's word. That's what got the Pharisees in all kinds of trouble, if you recall. They had made up all these rules and regulations about how to keep themselves from certain sins. And they began to add to it. That's why Jesus says, by the commandments of men, you make void the commandments of God. Let me give you an example of how they did that. You remember the, the Corbin, right? It's Corbin. See, you were, in t you were required by law to honor your father and mother. And that meant that when they got to a point in their age where they couldn't take care of themselves, you were to financially give them aid and help. Well, the way they got around this, boy, they were slick. They would set aside their money and say it is Corbin. That means it's been dedicated to God to be used for whatever God would have me use it for. And therefore, it cannot be touched for any other purpose. And they would make void the commandment of God to take care of mom and dad and still retain their money. All under the pretense of being godly. You see how that, that he says, by your traditions you've made void the commandments of God. And that's what happens when we get the word of God secondhand. We follow traditions of men instead of the word of God as it is. Uh, the second thing that, we, that happens is that we end up taking from the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God becomes sound bites. Uh, we see this more in Facebook than anything. Everything becomes a sound bite. Um, like uh, if you've ever gotten any discussion with anybody and you have to confront someone concerning a sinful behavior, you're not supposed to judge me. The Bible says you're not supposed to judge. Judge not unless you be judged. Matthew 7, 1. You see what ends up happening is you take verses of Scripture out of their context. That's what ends up happening when you get the Word of God secondhand, is it, it's taken out of context. I could show you that, you know, that, you know, if I wanted to, if I was to take verses just out of, out of clear blue, Judas went out and hung himself. Go and do thou likewise. What thou doest, doest quickly. That's all in the Bible. That's exactly what happens when we get the Word of God second hand. But when we read the verse of Scriptures in their context, we learn that when we judge, we need to understand that there needs to be the internal assessment of my sin, and if I've got the same sin that they have, then I need to deal with the sin I have before I deal with theirs. Right? And to also understand that by the same measure I give that judgment to them, it's going to be measured back to me. So if, for example... If you take away a teenager's car, right, for one sin, you need to be prepared to meet out that same judgment for what? Someone else. Or be ready for it to come back to you. Right? That's exactly what it's talking about. Now, this is all the things that happen. There's, there becomes, when we, when we follow men instead of God, when we get the word of God all secondhand, But I want to close with this. There is, some, there is a time. Let me, under, let me rephrase this. There is a time where it is acceptable for you to receive the word of God uh, through indirect means. But then there's a time that you grow up. There's a time that you read the word of God for yourself. And you discern it for yourself. Guess, get this, church. Whenever you put faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit took up residence. The author lives inside of you. And part of his ministry is to lead and to guide you in all these truths. He's to take you by the hand in these things. And so I would encourage you. You've got the same Holy Spirit that I have. Get that. You have the same Holy Spirit that I have, and you can get, and, say, me, and maybe you say, well, Brother Heath, I don't like you as a preacher. You've got the same Holy Spirit that they had. Charles Stanley has the same Holy Spirit. Okay? Adrian Rogers, I love Adrian Rogers. Same Holy Spirit dwells in you as it did in them. And he can lead and guide you in all truth 
just like he did them. Now, um, I want to leave this last verse with you because whenever, when we have this, this temptation of getting the Word of God indirectly, we take it out of its context or we add to it, uh, there's a warning at the very end of your Bible. It's kind of like the final credits, if you will. He says, For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, I know it's talking about the book of Revelation, but we can derive from it the principle. You don't take from the word of God out of its context, and you don't insert things that aren't there. God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible. That's Benjamin Franklin. Okay? <laughs> um, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child. That's not in there. Spare the rod, hate the child is what's in there. Much worse, isn't it? So I want to encourage you, read the Word of God for yourselves. Because your pastor, I'm a sinful man. I am. I deal with, um, I deal with sins of pride. Sometimes I want to preach to, so that you like it. It's part, of my, it's part of my nature to be liked. I don't know a person that's out there that just loves to be hated, but uh, that's certainly not me. I'm self-promoting. Uh, that's my sin. When I get out here and promote Park Avenue Baptist Church, I'm say, I'm Brother Heath. I'm the pastor at Park Avenue. I take a sense of pride in being your pastor. Don't get me wrong, but doing it the wrong way, which I've been guilty of. You see what I'm saying? I'm a sinful person. I still struggle with sin, just like you do. TV shows that I should not watch, I still struggle with that. I got to turn that off sometimes. And sometimes you say, oh, it's just one word. You just wait until another one pops up or something like that. Listen, I'm the same as you. The problem that is today is that we've lost our sense of shame in it, though. Uh, we, we, like to hide, um, we like to hide behind the idea that, well, everyone's doing it, so every, or everyone struggles with it, so therefore it's no longer uh, that big of a deal, Right? Uh, and we'll say it, and we'll even pray it. Lord, forgive me where I fail you. And I do that. But we don't go and list all the things of, on how we failed him. And so it just becomes a common place. And we hide behind uh, the sins that others also commit. And we take comfort in that. That everyone deals with this. So therefore, God's just going to grade on a curve. And this inevitably happens, okay? We no longer, because of that, we, we convey to the people abroad that judgment is not imminent. That sin's no big deal. You see where the problem we get into that? Listen, church, we need to confess our sins one to another so that we might be healed. Your pastor deals with pride. He deals with arrogance. He sometimes wants to stretch the truth, which is a lie, right? It's a, whole truth, uh, if it's an all truth, it's not a truth, it's a lie, right? The whole thing's a lie. All for the sake that people might like me sometimes. The problem that we face is that when we are no longer ashamed of these things, and we no longer seek out repentance, and we no longer seek out God to, to deal with us in this thing, and then the world abroad sees that the judgment of God is no longer imminent, people begin to move towards Jesus when they understand that there's just a heartbeat between them and eternity. That they could plunge into hell and that therewith quickly. And there'd be no recourse. There's no stop along the way. Why? Because of the sins that we have committed. We don't see as a big deal. But because of Jesus. Get this. I have forgiveness. You have forgiveness of sin. He died for those sins. Never take that away. It can only bring you to a state of humility and understanding that just for one, one of those sins was sufficient for that. That one time where I was arrogant, one time where I was self-promoting, one time, 
where I lie. One time, where it was worth my death, and then therefore Christ so loved me that he died for me. He was buried, he rose again. And we, we think that because sin is so prevalent in our society, that it's so rampant, that God is just turning a blind eye to it. No, if judgment is going to come. It's going to come soon and quickly to those who don't know him. I pray that you would move with a sense of urgency if you're lost here this morning. I pray that you would know that he will forgive your sins if you call on his name. Church, those loved ones that we know, they're going to plunge in there without a... They're going to plunge into hell without a Savior unless someone tells them. How shall they hear, right? Except there be a preacher. And I'm not talking about me. You're all preachers. You all have the same gospel that I preach to you if you are saved. You have the same Holy Spirit that I have that convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come that, that I have. And therefore, you can just as much be a witness of his glory as I can be. And so what I encourage you here, as we prepare for our invitation, I'm going to ask our musicians to come, is simply this. That God would so move you with a sense of urgency in the world around you. Uh, that, that, that there are two types of people in this world. That's it. No, and you say, no, because right now the current state of media would say that now there's black people, gay people, there's, um, there's Islamic, there's, uh, you know, all these different people out there, right? No, there's only two people. Those that are lost, those that are saved, those that are not, have not put their faith in Christ, and those who have. Both share, both have an eternity somewhere in one of two places. There's no difference. We're all sinners, say, and we're all sinners, and the only way we go to heaven to be with him is if we're saved by his grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And see, so there's another deception that's involved, too, with sin. Sometimes we think, well, that was back in my youth. That happened way back then. Sin is sin, and it bears with it that consequence, and it will happen. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to. He's going to judge the world in righteousness. And I would have you stand completely justified before him. But that is only for those who put faith and trust in him. And me believing on him doesn't matter for you. You believing on him makes all the difference.